The Unshackled Waves, Episode 62. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms and this is our first ever report show. This is another new format of the podcast. So how it all work is that we'll have a guest on the show who's been on the ground at a recent event so we can get a, a first hand account of how it went down. So our first guest is our new associate editor of the Unshackled, Tom Peroni. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. And Tom was at the International Conference on Men's Issues on the Gold Coast this past weekend, uh, the 9th to the 11th of June 2017. He was part of the official media crew with The Unshackled, uh, along with our editor-at-large, Max Luxton. He got to interview some of the speakers, so we thought we'd have Tom on to not just discuss the event, but also the coverage of the, the conference in Australia, and also to get, get to know Tom a bit as well. So, uh, Tom, you've written uh, a few articles for us uh, this year, but now you're officially part of the editorial team. So uh, f for our uh, listeners to get to know you, uh, what, uh, tell us a bit about your background and what drew you to The Unshackled. Yeah, sure. Um, so my background, um, I, I suppose I've always had a, an interest in you know, politics and the media and uh, particularly alternative media platforms. Um, and it would have been last year at some point, I think, when we were seeing the, the rise of information wars and Breitbart and platforms like that in the US. Um, and it, it occurred to me that, you know, we definitely need the equivalent in Australia or something similar, at least anyway. Um, and around about that time, I was getting a, a bit of my work published in The Spectator Australia. So obviously a, a mainstream conservative publication. Um, and I think it would have been in a Facebook group where I actually stumbled across the Unshackled. So from there, I, I decided to try getting some of my work published on uh, on the Unshackled. Uh, so I think I would have met you in about February or March this year, I believe. Yeah, we've met um, a couple and, of times now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that was probably the, the first time I got it published. And then, yeah, um, it's it's been great to have uh, gotten involved with the platform and get some of my work out there. And I really look forward to this opportunity to work as part of the editorial team. Yeah, we're cer certainly happy to have you on board. Uh, and yeah, uh, what you've stated there, it's exactly why we started The Unshackled, because yeah, we saw Bright Button Info Wars over in America, but there's absolutely nothing here for Australia apart from the establishment media uh, that, we're, that we've got, but we're, we certainly intend on, on changing that. Oh, mate, I look forward to it. It should be great. Now let's talk about the uh, the conference. Now uh, f uh, you were originally just going to go as just a, uh, an attendee, uh, but then you kindly offered to cover it on behalf of the Unshackled. Uh, what interested you in attending? Yeah, well, um, obviously I've um, I've got a bit of an interest in this, you know, this movement that we're seeing online at the moment. So a lot of people will call it the the alt right. Um, I prefer to avoid the term personally. Um, does have connotations, obviously, with um, some of this racial sort of politics that we're seeing emerging in the US. But, you know, call it what you want. It does include, um, you know, certain platforms, whether that be, uh, you know, 4chan and Reddit and things like that. But it also includes this, um, I suppose, this segment of the internet that we refer to as the so-called manosphere. So that includes various different re uh, websites. Um, obviously, you've got... Um, people like Roosh V and guys like that. I, I personally don't, I, I'm not a fan of Roosh V. I don't subscribe to that sort of ideology myself. But nonetheless, um, you do have quite a few different platforms that constitute this uh, this so-called manosphere, one of them being a voice for men, uh, which I personally think is probably one of the more um, positive websites within this movement. Anyways, I had stumbled across uh, some of this content and some of these ideas that, that are out there. And I, um, I suppose I just wanted to hear both sides of the story because, you know, a lot of the stuff that you hear from the mainstream in regards to this so-called men's rights movement, they are very much painted in a certain way. You know, we're, we're led to believe that it's a movement of, of hatred, of misogyny. Um, you know, we've, we've heard that they're racists and homophobes, apparently, um, anti-Semites even. So I thought I'd go along and check it out for myself, you know, meet some of the, uh, the leading figures of the movement. 
Um, and it was it was a fantastic experience, to be honest with you. There were some big names there. Um, not just that, even just talking to you know just the average the average attendee, you know, the people who didn't have a high profile. Um, I think plenty of people there gave me some fantastic insights, and I'm I'm glad to have walked away from that experience, being able to have heard uh, you know the the so-called MRA side of the story. Yeah, the reason why I'm broadly sympathetic with the, the men's right movement is because of, it's not because, you know, I've, I'm, I'm opposed to women's rights. I think that, yes, we, we can focus on women's issues and focus on men's issues as well, because contrary to, you know, what, uh, what we're told about the, you know, conspiracy theories about the, the pa- uh, patriarchy, you know, men have their, their issues as well, and they deserve to be discussed just as much as women's issues. Oh, look, you're exactly right. Um, I mean, there obviously there are more extreme, um, I suppose, fringes of this movement. And, you know, I, I mentioned Roosh V before. So he's an, uh, an American bloke. And he's if you provider. check out his website, there is a <laughs> provider. Okay. Well, regardless, I mean, you, you do have those fringes, those people who do have genuinely, you know, misogynistic thoughts. Um, I don't think that the majority of the people that, at this conference feel that way. I myself don't feel that way. And, you know, definitely the leaders of the movement, I, I don't think, feel that way either. Um, speaking with a lot of these people on the weekend, many of them that were there with their daughters, their wives, their girlfriends. You know, these just normal people like, you know, anyone else out there who just happen to have an interest in uh, particular gender-based issues which disproportionately affect men and boys. Yeah, and a lot of the, the speakers there were women as well, and of course uh, mothers. So it's yeah, it's it's def- it definitely brings in all sorts of people. Oh no, you're right. Um, I mean, for example, you know, Cassie J, who is the director of the Red Pill film, is of course a, a woman herself. Um, you've got people like Karen Strawn as well, so a, a Canadian men's rights activist who was there. Uh, Miranda Devine, Bettina Arndt. Uh, there's plenty of women in the movement. I don't think that. Um, this, you know, this uh, narrative that the mainstream likes to push that is a bunch of, you know, angry old white men. I just don't think it's accurate. Um, the other thing is the the fact that it's an international movement. So we had people coming in from all over the world. There were um, Indian MRAs present at the event. Um, and that definitely gave a lot of insight into, um, I suppose, the, uh, the movement's um, activity in a, a different culture. And it, it was really good to see that, uh, that international context uh, presented at the conference. Yeah, and we we're pretty lucky that, yeah, because it is an international movement that they chose Australia to, to have it uh, this year. But uh, let's move on to what were some of the topics uh, discussed? Yeah, uh, well, there, there were a range of different speakers, to be honest with you. Um, so it focused on everything from uh, you had Karen Strawn discussing the um, the ev- uh, evolutionary psychology perspective of the um, of the movement. You had people like Mark Latham. Um, giving his thoughts on identity politics. Um, Bettina Arndt, who obviously has a background as a sex therapist, so she was discussing things from that perspective. That was uh, most of the content on the first day. We then had the uh, the second day, which is mainly focusing on legal issues. So, uh, for example, the Western Australian Law Reform uh, Commissioner, a, uh, a man by the name of Augusto Zimmerman. So he's also a university professor at Murdoch University, so a law professor. Um, he was discussing a lot of the discrimination which we see uh, occurring in the family courts in Australia. And that was uh, definitely very fascinating, uh, some of the insight which he provided there. Yeah, uh, Augusto Zimmerman, he's actually, there's a campaign now to get him as the, the next head of the Australian Human Rights Commission. So it sounds like uh, oh, okay. the, the fact, the fact yeah. that he was there, that's a, that's a sign that he'd be <laughs> quite a good candidate. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't aware of that, actually. But, yeah, no, I think he would be a, a fantastic candidate. Um, so he was actually there with his wife, in fact, and she also came across as a, um, a very intelligent, well-spoken woman. And, yeah, I think Augusto is definitely one of the um, prom- uh, one of the most prominent legal minds that we've got in Australia at the moment. So it would be fantastic to see him appointed to a position like that. Now, uh, as you said, the, the thing that attracted you to this conference was obviously you'd been in the online sphere and noticed the, the men's rights movement. But were there things that you uh, learnt there at the, at the conference that you know, beha- uh, perhaps you weren't familiar with and were really eye- eye- eye-opening? 
Yeah, well, I was actually surprised by the, um, I suppose, the diversity of the movement. So as much as I, you know, I often cringe at this idea of, you know, diversity. It's a bit of a buzzword that the left likes to use. Um, but I, I suppose in this context, it was refreshing to see that there were various different people from various different backgrounds. So there were, you know, uh, blue collar workers right through to, you know, doctors and professors present at this event who were finding a common ground. There were, um, you know, people aged from, you know, their teenage years right through to, you know, elderly people in their 80s. It was just, it was such a, a fantastic opportunity to see so many different, um, I suppose, demographics within not just Australia, but throughout the world in general represented at this event. Um, and I think, yeah, the fact that it is such a diverse movement, um, I think is fantastic. And so you touched on some of the the topics there. So obviously, fa family court, which has been a an an issue for or oh, it's ma many years now. The fact that uh, me uh, men and fathers are uh, discriminated against against in the family court. So you would have heard, I guess, some of the the sad stories about fathers losing access to their children. Yeah, um, it, it's funny you should mention that actually, uh, because it. Um, it's one of those issues where I feel as though we really don't discuss it enough within the concept, uh, the context of the mainstream discourse. So it's it's one of those things where I think everyone is aware of it. So even you know, regardless of what your um, political engagement is, even if you're someone who you know doesn't have the faintest interest in politics, I think everyone is aware of the fact that the system is failing in this regard. Everyone is aware that this discrimination exists, and yet it's something that no one seems to want to talk about for some reason. It's it's always struck me as very bizarre the fact that it is. You know, it's something that that everyone knows about, and we just don't discuss it. Um, funnily enough, I actually I met a a young woman when I was there, so she would have been aged somewhere in her twenties, and she actually got enrolled uh, involved in the uh, the men's rights movement because she had grown up uh, more or less deprived of contact and deprived of a relationship with her father when she was growing up. So she'd gone all through her childhood and her teenage years without having um, any contact with her dad, not because he was a you know, a deadbeat or anything like that. Um, it was, you know, the family courts preventing that relationship from existing. It wasn't until she got to her 20s and, you know, became an adult that she was finally introduced to this man, you know, her biological father. Um, and, yeah, she was discussing how, um, you know, that had actually, you know, caused a lot of damage to her. So it's the sort of thing where it's not just men specifically. You know, if you think of, of this in the broader picture, it affects women as well. It affects families, children. Um, and it's it's really just quite devastating. Uh, there, there were plenty of people there. I would say the majority of the conference would have been um, fathers who have been affected by divorce and have seen firsthand how this system does discriminate against men. And like I said, I think it's something that we should very much introduce into the mainstream discourse, not just in Australia, but in an international context as well. Yeah, when you hear those stories, uh, it just breaks your heart and uh, to, uh, to hear about, well, it's not just, yeah, obviously the men themselves who discriminate against, but as you said there, the children who miss out as well. And also another uh, topic which was prominent in the conference was men's mental health, which uh, is, it's gaining a bit more prominence with organisations such as the, the Men's Shed, but still it's, it, it's hard to... Uh, get uh, get the message out there. Yeah, it was funny you should mention the men's shed. Um, there was actually someone else at the event who I was introduced to who was from, I think it was the University of Sydney, where apparently they tried to get a similar initiative uh, established at that university campus and the union actually shut it down because apparently it was uh, it was discriminatory, the fact that it was specifically there for men. Now, realistically, we are facing a suicide epidemic in Australia. And it is very much a gendered suicide epidemic. Uh, men are far more likely to commit suicide than women. Obviously, there are certain, um, I suppose, gender-based expectations which place, you know, extreme pressure on young men. And we're seeing this manifest itself in this, as I said, this suicide epidemic. Um, so I definitely think there is, um, there's plenty of reason to have not just programs, but I suppose more public awareness of, of what we're seeing, not just in Australia, but throughout the world. And it's yeah, as you said, it's heartbreaking to see that a lot of these issues just aren't being addressed. Yeah, and also uh, another, a lot of the, the opposition from the, the men's right movement uh, is uh, comes from the feminists who claim that it's either pro-domestic violence or ignores domestic violence. I mean, uh, what's the truth? Was the topic touched, touched on at all at the, the conference? Yeah, well, look, it did come up. Um, I believe it was Miranda Devine's speech, actually, where she discussed, and in fact, Mark Latham as well, both of them, uh, where they discussed the fact that, you know, if you look at the statistics, um, 
domestic violence really is not a gender-based issue. Um, you know, there are there were you know um, plenty of statistics raised pointing out that um, you know there are plenty of women who hit on men and vice versa. Um, and this idea that we're seeing this this narrative pushed by the mainstream, and that's not just the media, but political parties as well. The two major parties, Labor and Liberal, are very much pushing this narrative that it's violence against women. Um, now, obviously, I don't think anyone in their right mind would endorse you know, violence against women or violence against anyone for that matter. Uh, so the fact that we are seeing this narrative pushed within the mainstream, it is very problematic. Um, in fact, there was a domestic violence researcher there, so a woman, in fact, who was keen on dispelling this myth. So that was her... Um, you know, what had, what had led her to become involved in the movement was the fact that she wanted to shed light on this common misconception which exists. Uh, I remember, I think it was late last year, Bettina, aren't she, she actually published an article that was in the Australian talking about how the, the male victims of domestic violence and how they're ignored and denied access to domestic violence uh, shelters. So, yes, it's, it's not a, a gendered issue. Uh, also, some of the other... Uh, concerns that men's rights activists have, uh, of course, uh, workplace uh, fatalities, the fact that they're dis disproportionately uh, affecting men, the fact that more homeless uh, pe uh, people are men, and also that in oh, crim criminal cases, men always receive a harsher sentence than a woman. Yeah, well, it's, um, I mean, all of those things that you mentioned were raised at various points throughout the conference, but I think particularly that last point you mentioned, so the fact that we do have different outcomes in terms of criminal sentencing, I think that's that's very worrying, the fact that we, you know, we do have a judicial system in Australia which, yeah, which does actually discriminate on that basis. And I, I think regardless of what gender you are, whether you're a man or a woman, if you commit a crime, you should be held responsible for, for what you've done. Um, so I think it is very much a systemic issue which we're facing in many ways. Um, and I think it's great that there is a movement out there which is willing to address these sorts of issues. Yeah, I did an article, it was only a few weeks ago now, um, because there was a, a woman who was uh, convicted of drowning three of her children and she only got 20 years jail compared to a man who committed pretty much exactly the same crime and got life. and. I've hmm. compared the two and saying, is this female privilege? And I i didn't just focus on that case. I also focused on another case where a parent had murdered their child and the, the woman had, had received less. It, always, it almost seems as if we hold women to less responsibility, that it's not them who committed it. It must be some, some other force. Yeah, it was funny you should mention that. Uh, there was another speaker. His name actually escapes me at the moment, but he did discuss uh, the specific case or cases, in fact, which you just mentioned. So the fact that uh, a man who murders children is uh, is liable for a murder charge, whereas a woman is liable for what's called an infanticide charge. So it's literally a different law which uh, which they're charged under. Um, but as you said, it's more or less the same crime. Now, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I personally think that anyone who murders a defenseless child should be given life in prison. And obviously those men should be, you know, locked away and the, the key thrown away. Um, but it is very bizarre that, you know, that there are women who aren't held to, um, to account in the same way. Um, and as I said, I, you know, I personally, um, you know, I've always, you know, been sympathetic to the, um, the idea of defending children. You know, they are our future. So if we're not going to hold people to account who go to the effort of murdering children, then I, I think it is worrying to think what society will, um, will look like in the longer term, if that's the sort of world that we're creating for the next generation. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, now, let's move on to now, you not only got to hear the, the speakers as well, but uh, as part of the, the media crew, you got to interview some of the speakers as well. So uh, do you want to talk about that experience? Yeah, um, it was a fantastic experience, actually. So I was able to have interviews with both Cassie J, so the director of the Red Pill film, and also Mark Latham, so I see the former Labour leader turned um, political commentator. Now, I'm a massive fan of both of them. Um, so it was, it was quite a nerve wracking experience, really. But they were both lovely people, to be honest with you. Um, so meeting them in person, I yeah, I was a little bit daunted, but two of the nicest people I've ever met. I couldn't speak highly enough of, um, of both of them, to be honest with you.
And we met uh, Mark Latham at the, the Friedman Conference uh, back here in uh, late April. And it was funny when we, we introduced ourselves from the Unshackled, he, he already knew who we were. And he's like, oh, I remember you wrote an article about the Unsiders and like gave us his yeah. card. And it, yeah, it was all really cool. So yeah, Latham, uh, uh, Latham is yeah familiar uh, with, the, with the Unshackled now. So yeah, it was mm. good that uh, uh, we finally uh, got to have an interview with him. Yeah, um, well, I, to be honest with you, most of what we discussed was just politics um, it, rather than the actual, you know, men's rights movement itself. Um, so the main thing I wanted to get out of him was whether or not he was going to make a return to Australian politics, uh, which I would love to see happen. But he just, he wouldn't give us a straight answer, unfortunately. So, um, you know, fingers crossed, but we'll see. Time will tell. Well, he's joined the, the Liberal Democrats, which is the political party that uh, I'm a member of. So he's just, yeah. he's just a ordinary member at this stage. But yeah, I th uh, I'm not too I'm not too sure whether yeah he's probably I mean given his last experience in in politics and being burned in the system, maybe a political comeback sort of <laughs> last thing he wants to do. But he's just signed up with yeah. Rebel Media, so it's obvious he's you know very keen on, uh, you know, alternative media. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, so, in fact, he was in Canada, I think, um, right up until the day before the conference began. So he was visiting uh, Ezra Levant, I think his name is. The, yes. Uh, yes, the um, the chief, is he chief executive, I assume, of of um, Rebel Media. So he, yeah, so Mark had only just gone back from Canada um, on the day of the conference, I think, or the day before. Um, so he was a little bit jet lagged, but yeah, he still he gave a fantastic speech, and yeah, everyone there loved him. So he actually got a um, a standing ovation at the end of his speech, which was great to see. Uh, I, he's, he's definitely an excellent and entertaining speaker as well. Now, yeah. uh, let, let's talk about uh, uh, Cassie J and the Red Pill. So she not only mm. appeared at this conference, uh, but was here to promote the the movie uh, in Australia. And I recall when this movie first uh, got released, there was a petition to get her banned from Australia, which uh, thankfully uh, our government ignored and she was allowed into Australia. Uh, but considering Australia's track record of uh, banning uh, pe uh, pe uh, people who uh, the feminists and left don't like, uh, it did worry me a bit. But uh, I... I have just like the the people on Sunrise. I haven't had the the pleasure of watching the film yet. Um, so I'll ask you, what was the film actually like? Uh, honestly, probably um, probably one of the best movies I've ever seen. Um, it's one of those films where um, I think it is going to be a defining film for uh, not just our generation, but possibly generations to come. Um, I mean, this is you know this whole movement that we're seeing. It's really only existed online for many years, to be honest with you. And I think the, the red pill very much represents, um, you know, the so-called men's rights movement, you know, moving away from the, you know, the, the shadows of just being some sort of a, you know, bizarre sort of online community to actually reaching into the mainstream. I mean, it was a fantastic film. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of Cassie's directing skills. And I think it's great to see that, you know, this is a woman who used to be a feminist. Okay. You know, she was, she was part of the, you know, the so-called establishment. She was a, a darling of the left in many ways to see that she actually had the, um, you know, the integrity and the gutsiness to go out and make this film and question that mainstream narrative and very much put her reputation on the line. Um, I think that very much speaks volumes um, about her as a person. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I really do think that many of us, uh, not just within that movement, but from society more broadly, owe Cassie J a deal. Yeah, well, that's why the film's called The Red Pill, because uh, for those who don't you know, know, there's uh, taking the red pill as, as termed coming into reality, the real world. Uh, it's mm. it's probably most known for in the movie The Matrix, where Neo is offered the, the blue pill, uh, which will send him back to the Matrix, and then the red pill, which will take him to the to the real world, for those who aren't, aren't familiar with it. But it's, yeah, it's, it's quite a common term now, red pill red pilling people so that's why uh, it's the movie's about her own red pilling uh yeah and as you said she she comes from left-wing background i mean one of her previous uh, documentaries was about uh gay rights so yeah, that tells you a lot uh, a lot about what sort of background she's 
she's been from. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't surprise me now that yeah the the left have uh, turned on her because they're uh, excel at devouring their own. I mean, it's amazing now that the left they hate uh, Richard Dawkins and Piers Morgan now. I mean, <laughs> what world are we living in? <laughs> well, Mark oh, Latham as well. You can add to that list while you're at it. Yes. Um, but, they, they never really liked Mark Latham too much, though. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I, as I said, I um, meeting Cassie J in person as well, she's really just one of the nicest, loveliest people you'd ever meet because I, I've met a lot of famous people in my time and usually they're quite um, stuck up and, you know, arrogant in some ways. But Cassie was just so down to earth, uh, just such a genuine person, and it was just an absolute pleasure to meet her in person. Uh, well, uh, well, certainly the strained media weren't very nice to her. I mean, she was mm. interviewed on the the project, uh, which uh, we we know how terrible that pro program is, and also uh, Weekend Sunrise, which well, I consider just Andrew O'Keefe just a a moron. While the the people on the project, <laughs> they're they're genuinely nasty people, and uh, yeah. as we learnt from from Cassie J later on when she was on the Bolt Report, that it was a pre recorded interview, and they cut. A lot of a lot of what she said, and basically, you know, accused her of saying like you don't care about you know domestic uh, vi uh, vi uh, violence at all. Like this is your film's horrible because of that, and it was just really outrageous. You know what they were accusing her of. Yeah, well, actually, we covered that in the interview with her. So um, as it turned out, the that interview that was shown on the project, um, I think they only showed about a you know, three or four minutes snippet. It turns out they actually had a massive interview, over 10 minutes apparently, uh, discussing the film and, you know, discussing her own personal views. And they actually ed edited a lot of that content out. Uh, so, you know, Cassie said at various points that, you know, she defends women's rights and, you know, she, she's all for female empowerment. And yet, you know, as you saw in the final um, product that the project showed, they didn't, they cut all that stuff out and they just tried to portray her as being some, you know, heartless monster, which I just think is disgusting. Because as I said, this, you know, Cassie was just one of the, one of the nicest, loveliest people I've ever met. So it was devastating to see her, um, how she was treated on not just the project, but as you mentioned, Sunrise as well. Uh, I pr I probably uh, uh, being, a, being a nice person is probably not what you need for going on the project. I mean, you need to rip, uh, rip them to, to shreds and give them a taste of their own medicine. But yeah, it's obviously not in Cassie's nature. Yeah. Yeah, no, look, she remained very professional, though, like full credit to her. Um, I mean, I think if I was in that same situation, I wouldn't have been able to um, conduct myself in such a pro uh, professional manner. But she you know, she definitely held it together. Um, but I think you know, it, it really does just speak volumes about the sorts of people that work for, for some of these organizations, you know, the Wiley Ali's and the Andrew O'Keefe's of the world. Um, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't even think that they're particularly intelligent people, Andrew O'Keefe especially. Um, I honestly, I'd love to know how some of these people got these jobs because they, you know, you wouldn't even really say that they're journalists as such. They're just talking heads. And yeah, as far as I can tell, most of them are just there to more or less repeat, um, you know, lines that they've been fed as far as I can tell. Well, Andrew O'Keefe, well, he originally started as a so-called comedian, and let's not forget, for about a decade, he his job was uh, opening briefcases on <laughs> a, de a Deal or No Deal. Uh, now he's uh, a TV presenter, but of course they they got mm. caught out there the weekend sunrise uh, pe uh, people because they they claim they hadn't had access to the film yet. Cassie J showed the the emails that uh, you know she'd sent to them with uh, links for them to be able to watch the movie. So they were caught out lying. Publicist and I believe Bettina Arndt as well also sent them um, access to, to this film I think a month before and then two weeks before and then even a few days before. And as she said in the interview, even if for whatever reason they still couldn't get onto the film via those links, they had the option of, um, of downloading the film of, you know, from various different sources. Um, so clearly there was a, um, an intention not to watch the film. Which, uh, you know, to be honest with you, I think actually did them a disservice because as we saw during the interview, they were, they were grilling her on what was, you know, what was in the film. I think there was one point where they said something specifically about, um, you know, something provocative that, uh, that Paul Elam had wrote at one point and they were asking her, oh, why didn't you at any point, um, you know, question him on that? And as it turned out within, I think, literally the first five minutes of the film, Cassie actually addressed that exact point that they raised. So, I mean, when Andrew O'Keefe said in the interview that, you know, he'd only seen certain parts of the film, 
I honestly, I don't think he saw any of the film, um, as far as I can tell. Like maybe the trailer, but as I said, the the thing, you know, the things that he said, which were uh, which Cassie obviously rebutted, were covered literally within the first five minutes of the film. Um, so you know, I, I'm sure that Andrew likes to think he's a very busy, important person, but I'm sure that he could have found the time to watch this at some point. Um, but yeah, no, just just a disgusting display, not just from them, but also from Wale and his mates on the project. Uh, it's probably not him who actually watches these things. He's probably got a producer who watches it, takes down notes, and gives it to him to to interview. I mean, that, that that's probably how yeah. it works. And we, we've noticed that Cassie J has posted on the Red Pill page that Sunrise is now trying to get all of the, the interviews uh, uh, that... Uh, that uh, that uh, feature Cassie that Jay taken down off social media for you know so-called copyright infringement, even though uh, these these sorts of interviews are reposted everywhere because they were they were caught out lying. Yeah, it's interesting you should mention that actually. So um, there's a, a YouTube personality from Brisbane um, who goes by the name of Eight Bits, so Eight Bit Thoughts, I think. Actually, he's been on this show in fact yes. at some point. Um, he he actually posted recently on Facebook that he was trying to access that exact video because he wanted to you know throw something together and he was not allowed to access it facebook had actually prevented him from accessing that particular footage because uh, and he got a message saying that apparently it was a uh, some sort of a, a legal violation of some sort so channel uh, channel 7 had actually gone to the effort of you know having that interview removed because it was so embarrassing for them it's illegal to to mock us that that must have been yeah. their argument <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but as uh, Cassie J uh, throughout her media appearances said, she she just didn't understand why the movie was so controversial in Australia, and there's been so many uh, screenings of it uh, can- cancelled. I mean, it's not just petitions, but also people sending through you know death threats, uh, which has scared mm. uh, a lot of uh, cinemas from showing it. Uh, it was shown uh, after the the Friedman conference uh, had concluded, so I had to catch a flight, which is why I I couldn't see it. But it was was screened there, so um, people there had the the opportunity to see it. But why do we have this problem discussing? men's rights in Australia? Is it, is it because this like, domestic violence epidemic is it's constantly uh, pa- parroted throughout all our mainstream media that just makes to- talking about men's rights seem uh, insensitive or inappropriate? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, um, that you should raise that because I, I felt as though most of the things raised at the conference weren't particularly uh, controversial. I mean, in most cases, I think that the average person on the street would agree with most of the things you know that were that were raised there. So, uh, the suicide epidemic or the um, the sort of treatment that we're seeing in the family courts, I think the average person can agree with uh, with most of this content, regardless of their political affiliation. So, I think the fact that there are you know a certain vocal minority in society that want to prevent us from from accessing this sort of content, I think it's quite disturbing, really, um, when you think about it. Yeah. So, interestingly enough, despite the the best efforts of you know, this vocal minority, uh, despite what we saw at the University of Sydney with those protests and, and despite these, um, you know, these threats that were directed to some of these cinemas, I think if anything, it actually did wonders for Cassie in the promotion of her film. Um, I mean, so many people wouldn't even be, have been aware that, uh, that this movie existed until, um, you know, some of these efforts were made. And then I think after that, what we saw was uh, the, the public awareness of the movie just skyrocketed and so many people would have gone to the effort of, of watching the film because of what they did. Um, in fact, there's a, a theory, it's often referred to as the Streisand effect. So I'm not uh, aware if you're, uh, sorry, not sure if you're aware of it. Yes, it's named after, of that. Uh, yeah, I'll just explain it for the viewers anyway. So, um, so obviously there's the famous Hollywood actress called uh, Barbara Streisand and there was I think a, an incident from maybe 10, 15 years ago approximately where uh, the media had either photos of or information relating to her address and she was trying to uh, cover this up and trying to um, you know prevent this information from being released to the public and in doing so actually um, drew attention to this information Um, so you know obviously you can see the same sort of principle applying here where despite the best efforts of um, you know these these feral um, you know social justice warriors we're still seeing that uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people are going to the effort of seeing the film. In fact, I believe it was the number one most downloaded film uh, in all of Australia 
um, just last week. So it's actually it's producing the uh, the re uh, reverse result of what they intended in many cases. Funnily enough. Well, the reason why the left and the feminists don't want people to see it is because they're scared that people will be convinced by the you know arguments and facts that are that are put forward in it. I mean, that's why they constantly sh try to shut down events and and speakers they don't like because they they don't have the the confidence in the strength of their own arguments, so they have to prevent facts from the other side getting out. Well, yeah, e either that or if they do go to the effort of you know, having a debate or having a discussion of any sort, it always seems to be very, um, either very imbalanced or just, just very snarky in general. I mean, as we saw on the weekend with Cassie, they weren't really willing to have a proper interview with her. It was just, just constant, um, really quite petty attacks on her. Uh, you see so similar sort of stuff on Q&A where they'll just, you know, they'll stack the panel. They'll have, you know, usually, you know, a left-wing politician, a left-wing journalist and, you know, I don't know, some... You know, some actor or singer or some bullshit, and then they'll just have you know the lone conservative having to defend themselves. And I think, regardless of what your political views may be, the fact that there is that um, that imbalance there, I think it's really starting to to get to the point where people are starting to see through it. People are starting to see that this bias exists. And uh, you know, ideally, what I would want to see happen is in Australia something similar to what we're seeing in you know other parts of the world, like the US, for example, where people are very much rejecting the mainstream media. They're rejecting this narrative, and they're starting to to instead find alternative uh, sources of media. Oh, well, yeah, Network 10 has gone into voluntary administration over the, the past few days, and, of course, yeah. Fairfax uh, uh, cutting uh, jobs and uh, budgets left, right and centre. So, so we are seeing, seeing the decline of uh, the mainstream media. It just, as is always the case with these US phenomena, it just takes a while to get to Australia. Yeah, well, you're right. Um, interestingly enough, uh, it's not actually my own uh, my own thought on this, but I do remember someone pointing it out to me a while back that most of the social and political trends which we see happening in the US, it's usually a delay of about 10 to 15 years until uh, more or less the same thing happens in Australia. Reagan in the 80s, we then had John Howard lead a conservative revolution, you know, 10 to 15 years later. So. You know, a lot of these trends that we see emerging in the US, it's it's very much just a, uh, a prediction of what we're going to see happening in Australia in years to come. Yeah, but I can't uh, still help but feel that it's the, the left to control the agenda in Australia. And I think the reason why the the fe feminist lobby are particularly feral in Australia because they, they were empowered by Julie Gillard's time as Prime Minister, where uh, basically Julie Gillard said, if you criticise my poor leadership, you're a misogynist. And of course, there was a famous misogyny <laughs> speech against Tony Abbott, where uh, him looking at his watch was uh, misogynist. And there, there was also, she had a, before she got deposed, uh, with a women for Gillard event where she said we don't want men in red ties uh, running the government and like it was just endless or, or, or she, but basically every second word was uh, misogyny and so that uh, that empowered you know a lot of these you know the Clementine Fords the Van Badams of the world really empowered them and they've been and now they were also successfully able to like beat Tony Abbott to a pulp where he uh, said that he was a, a, a feminist and you know ha always had his daughters all, all around him and like they they really like, a, 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 as like some people would say they really cucked Tony Abbott and, ma and made him you know into you know what uh, of you know a, a feminist model and, and so I think that that's why men's rights it's really difficult to have the conversation just because the feminist lobby have been so so successful in influencing both sides of both sides of politics you know, yeah you you're right actually um in fact something a similar point was raised at the conference so there were representatives there from the uk and they were pointing out how the current british prime minister uh, theresa may uh, now i wasn't aware of this incident but apparently at one point in time she was approached by uh, a rap radical feminist organization, so apparently a group of, I think they were defined as feminist anarchists or just, just something ridiculous like that. They had actually approached Theresa May with a uh, t-shirt which had written on it, uh, I am a feminist or I am a proud feminist or something like this. And Theresa May, who is of course the leader of the uh, United Kingdom's Conservative Party, wore this shirt and was happy to, to have photos taken um, of herself wearing this shirt. And it just goes to show you that um, you know, the uh, the left does very much have that um, stranglehold in many ways. So you'll see, you know, even the right wing of politics is willing to, um, to kowtow to them in many ways.
Uh, luckily, we do have a few politicians that are willing to, to speak the truth on this. I mean, Pauline Hanson has spoken about the injustice of the, the family court system and uh, Liberal Democrat Senator David Lineham has, you know, uh, tried to, uh, you know, point, uh, point to the real facts on uh, domestic violence and questioned, you know, all of this, you know, money that's being thrown at it. Yeah, well, it's great to see. Um, even uh, to his credit, um, George Christensen. So he's a member of the LNP in Queensland, um, obviously, you know, one of the major parties. But even still, um, George Christensen has actually also voiced quite similar sentiments. So you do have, um, you know, some people on the fringes who are willing to speak out on this. But unfortunately, it's the sort of topic that it just it really hasn't reached the mainstream at this point. Um, and in fact, the what I mentioned before in regards to the um, you know, some of the representatives from the UK, they were discussing how there was a British politician, um, I think his name was Philip, uh, Philip Davies or Philip Davis, I believe. Apparently he had attended the equivalent conference the year before, which was held in London, and he was absolutely destroyed by the media. So the Guardian apparently uh, wrote articles for about a week straight saying that uh, Philip Davis should be sacked that he should, you know, he should stand down simply because he attended this particular conference. And apparently out of all of the uh, MPs in the British Parliament, this one MP, Philip Davis or Davies, whatever his name is, apparently he's the only one willing to actually come out publicly in support of this movement. And that's despite the fact that he's, you know, he said quite openly that behind closed doors there are um, members of Parliament on both sides of politics, so from the, the Labour Party and from the Conservative Party who, you know, behind closed doors will express these sorts of sentiments um, but most of them don't have the balls to actually come out, um, you know, into the the public sphere and voice these sorts of ideas because it's just so stigmatised that um, that they just know, you know, it'll it'll be disastrous for their image as it was for him. Yeah. Well, that's part of our job at the Unshackled is to to ma uh, make sure that you know they, these issues show that they're not fringe issues; that they are you know concerns of mainstream Australia and uh, or ordinary people, and communicate to the to the politicians so so that we get a few more like uh, Christensen, Linehelm, and Hanson, you know, to, uh, able to to speak out on this issue. Well, yes. I mean, it's interesting that you should raise that. Um, I'm sure you're you're aware of the concept of the Overton window, so the uh, um, range of ideas that are acceptable to um, be discussed within the realm of public discourse. And I think it is very important to extend that window because we do currently live in a society where there are, you know, certain ideas which are, I suppose, frowned upon. You know, you don't you won't hear about them in, in the mainstream, whether it be from mainstream political parties or, or from mainstream media sources. And I think in order to um, get these ideas out there in order to extend that window of acceptable public discourse. It's important to have, um, you know, alternative media sources like the Unshackled to provide that uh, that platform. Yeah, well, we're certainly we're, we've come a long way in the uh, eight, nine months that we've been in existence. We we certainly intend to keep going. So uh, that concludes the end of our first ever report show. So th thank you, Tom, for coming on, and obviously we look more look forward to more of your work in the in the in the future. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me, Tim. And so to our uh, listeners, I hope that this uh, show format gave you a, a good insight and the interviews from the conference are now up on YouTube. So I'll leave the, the links to those uh, in the description and, of course, on the show notes page. And we will have a, another report show when uh, we have our next event. We, we quite like going to these events, so we'll certainly do some, some more in the future, won't we? Oh, definitely. I look forward to it. And of course, the usual reminders uh, apply at the end of the show. If you haven't already signed up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe, uh, please look at our upcoming events at theunshackled.net slash events. Uh, we also have Unshackled merchandise for, for sale at theuprightmarket.com. Uh, also, you can support the work of The Unshackled. You can become a patron on Patreon. We've also arranged some awesome benefits for our patrons, so there's also uh, some rewards for supporting us as well. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And, of course, don't forget to keep visiting theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.